Welcome. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 21st annual Frank M. Coffin Lecture on Law and Public Service. Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Peter Pittagoff. I'm Dean of the University of Maine School of Law, and we're very proud to sponsor the annual Coffin Lecture. We're honored this evening to welcome Judge Nancy Gertner as our distinguished Coffin Lecturer. There are obviously many distinguished people here tonight, but I want to give a special welcome to Ruth Coffin. And of course, to other members of the Coffin family, Susan Babb, Nancy Kurtz, Meredith Coffin here too. Um, and I'd also like to uh, welcome John Reinstein, Judge Gertner's husband. Well, it's truly a pleasure to welcome Nancy Gertner. Um, her life, uh, her career, reflect Judge Coffin's values of integrity, of excellence, of public service. Judge Gertner has been a lifelong champion of civil rights and women's rights. She was a U.S. District Court judge in Massachusetts from 1994 to 2011. She's a teacher and an author, and she serves as a professor of practice at Harvard Law School. Many of us recall Nancy Gertner as an advocate and a defense lawyer prior to her judicial career. She seemed to be everywhere, fighting for justice in high-profile cases and behind the scenes. In a moment, we'll hear a proper introduction by Nancy's friend and colleague, Sharon Beckman, who's a former clerk of Judge Coffin's. As you know, the community of Coffin clerks is a dynamic and diverse group. There are over 60 lawyers and judges and professors and civic leaders who've been clerks to Judge Coffin. They worked with the University of Maine School of Law over two decades ago to establish this lecture series. And they continue to help sustain the tradition and spirit and momentum of the series and to celebrate the values and legacy of their mentor. Judge Frank Coffin, as we all know, was a distinguished member of the judiciary, and he had an impressive career spanning all three branches of federal government. But it's his rich personal relationships that so many of us remember and value most. The Maine Law Review published a symposium issue in 2011, volume 63, number two, if you're interested. Um, it was dedicated to Judge Coffin's remarkable legacy. The issue provides a glimpse into the judge's wisdom and intelligence, his commitment to social justice and public service, his kindness, his wit. Many of us remember Judge Coffin's signature introductions to the annual Coffin Lectures. Once again, the Coffin clerks have stepped up to support this lecture series with a new chapter of introductions by former clerks of Judge Coffin, people who knew the judge so well. We're fortunate this evening that Sharon Beckman joins us to introduce our lecturer. Sharon Beckman is a professor at Boston College Law School at BC, she's co-director of the Criminal Justice Clinic and director of the Boston College Innocence Project. She's taught criminal law, criminal procedure, constitutional law, and seminars on the Supreme Court, white collar crime, and punishment. Sharon earned her undergraduate degree with honors from Harvard and her law degree from the University of Michigan. She served as a law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor of the U.S. Supreme Court, and most notably as a law clerk to Judge Frank Coffin on the First Circuit Court of Appeals. After clerking, she practiced law in criminal and civil litigation, administrative proceedings, and internal corporate investigations, and especially relevant this evening, Sharon worked for a number of years with Nancy Gertner. Less relevant, perhaps, but awfully impressive, Sharon Beckman successfully swam across the English Channel. <laughs> 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 
haven't we all? <laughs> At one point, she was ranked first in the US and third in the world among female marathon swimmers, and she remains a nationally ranked US Masters swimmer. We're honored that she's here tonight. Please join me in welcoming Sharon Beckman. I'm so grateful to Dean Pitikoff for giving me this double honor of paying tribute to my beloved Judge Coffin by introducing my beloved Nancy Gertner. Um, and I'm so happy to be doing that in the company of the Coffin family, Ruth and Susan, Meredith and Nancy, and also in the company of the extended Coffin family because the Coffins inc included all of us clerks in their family, um, most especially Judge Coffin's career clerk and my co-clerk, Barbara Regalhaup, and Judge Coffin's uh, longtime administrative secretary, Gail Rice. <laughs> I'm also delighted that uh, Nancy's husband, John Reinstein, is here to give me the opportunity um, to say that in addition to being the spouse of Superwoman and co-parenting with her, there are three children. John, for around 40 years, was the executive director of the ACLU of Massachusetts um, and a great example of the spirit of the Coffin Lecture in his own right. And John also illustrates for me very clearly, just like Ruth Coffin, how people who accomplish great things in life are often, that's often made possible because they had really special partners um, who were able to do things with them and support them in everything that they did. So I'm really happy that you're here, John. Well, this is the 21st anniversary of the Coffin Lecture, so in a way, the Coffin Lecture has reached adulthood. Um, and in that way, I think it's fitting for me to go back to the birth of the Coffin Lecture um, to rediscover its meaning and purpose. So I went back to the very first Coffin Lecture um, to read uh, one of the judge's famous introductions of the lecturers. Um, and, and these were his um, remarks that were delivered in Portland High School uh, in October of 1992. And he said that the purpose of the Coffin Lecture was really twofold. One purpose was to keep alive the old ideal of public service. And writing 21 years ago, he felt that this was more important than ever at a time when growing numbers of Americans were frustrated in their inability to share in the American dream. He, he described that as a time when there was widespread distrust in our institutions and leaders, hmm, <laughs> leading to, among other problems, a loss of faith in the practices and processes of law. So one purpose of the Coffin Lecture was to find some inspiration, some reason to believe um, that the law could play a role in accomplishing the social good. And the second purpose of the Coffin Lecture, he said, was to celebrate, these are his words, the ingredient of joyful satisfaction, of pure fun, that's realized in its perfect state when a lawyer finds his energies directed to the public good. And in thinking about those two purposes of the Coffin Lecture, I realized that Nancy Gertner is the absolutely perfect Coffin Lecturer because her example inspires us to know that it's possible to live an authentic life in the law, to use the law as a means of achieving progressive social change, and to have great fun doing it. Um, this too is a time when it's very easy to lose faith in the law. Um, and so it's very important to have leaders in the bar who are true believers that the law can accomplish good. And Nancy is a true believer in all of her professional activities, advocating, judging, writing, public speaking. She embraces them with a kind of fearlessness and joyful abandon that is rare in public life and inspiring to everyone in its orbit. One of my favorite Nancy Gertner expressions, she has a lot of expressions, is that law is like silly putty. <laughs> and I think that tells you <laughs> something about the joy uh, and the, with which she approaches her career and the ways in which she doesn't always take herself so seriously. You know, silly putty is that sort of ooey gooey children's toy that comes in an egg and you take it out and you can mold it to different shapes. It, it, 
It picks up pictures off the, off the comics and so on. But the, the main idea is that law isn't some rigid set of rules, the point of which is to maintain the status quo, but something creative that advocates and, either, and even judges can shape and mold to improve the quality of justice in people's lives. And, and that that creative endeavor is hard work, but also the source of endless joy. Nancy was born in Flushing, Queens, at a time when girls weren't expected to do too much. The pinnacle for a girl maybe was to be a cheerleader, which Nancy did accomplish in addition to being number one in her class. After earning an undergraduate degree at Barnard and a master's in political science and a JD from Yale, Nancy served as a law clerk for Judge Luther Swigert of the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. At that point, she thought she might practice law for a year or two before becoming an academic. But something happened on the way to the ivory tower. Um, most notably, her successful defense of anti-war activist Susan Sachs in her 1975 murder trial catapulted Nancy into the spotlight and led to a 20 plus year career as a partner in her own law firm and one of the greatest trial attorneys ever in Massachusetts history. Notice that I didn't say one of the greatest female trial attorneys in Massachusetts history, because even though it was true that at that time there were very few female trial attorneys, Nancy literally had no role model, um, and even though it was true that it, she, in that regard she was a tra trailblazer, there's no limitation on my acknowledgement that she is really one of the greatest trial attorneys ever. Nancy represented every kind of client in a very wide range of complex civil and criminal litigation. But she's most famous for her work both in the civil and criminal context on behalf of women. In the civil context, Nancy um, brought groundbreaking, groundbreaking litigation that, that guaranteed public funding for reproductive choice for women in Massachusetts. She won sex discrimination verdicts and settlements on behalf of women discriminated against in the workplace from every walk of life. Her clients included professors and corporate executives uh, and also women who worked in the factories, um, baggage handlers, firefighters. On the criminal side, again, Nancy handled many high profile cases, but s some of the ones she is best known for um, involve crimes, bought, brought, uh, charges, unique charges brought against women, um, and especially um, homicide charges against women. Nancy um, successfully represented women, battered women, charged with crimes, charged with first degree murder for defending themselves against abusive spouses and boyfriends, and, and in the course of that was one of the first attorneys ever to um, achieve the admission of battered women syndrome testimony in support of a claim of self-defense. She also represented a number of women who were charged with serious crimes, allegedly for harms unintendedly caused to fetuses they were carrying, including homicide. She was courageous too in defending um, a young man who was convicted of rape, even though it earned her criticism from many in the women's community but she did it because she believed it was the right thing to do. The, the stories of these and many other great cases that Nancy handled, you can read about in her book, In Defense of Women, Memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate. Nancy was nominated to the United States District Court by President Clinton in 1994 on the recommendation of Massachusetts Senators Ted Kennedy and John Kerry, and she served in that capacity from 1994 until 2011. In her role as a United States District Court judge, she showed great humanity in a place where that is not always apparent, especially to the poor and underclass. She wrote opinions in a system where for district court judges, explaining your reasons was not something always rewarded. Her opinions, especially in the areas of racial equality, forensic science, and sentencing are forward thinking. And just to show a little bit about how she likes to play, she also was a leader in the court with respect to technology, introducing the court um, to more and better ways of using technology both within and without of the courtroom. One thing that many people wonder, I myself wondered, 
apart from the question of how could someone so remarkable make it through the confirmation process, um, was how could somebody who was such a great and passionate advocate for the defense find satisfaction in the more neutral role of judge? I asked Nancy that question myself, and her answer was quite simple. It was her belief that she could do, at this stage in her career, more good in that role, and that it was her responsibility to do that. Too soon for the law, but thankfully for her teaching, um, Nancy retired from the bench in 2011 and became professor of practice at Harvard Law School. In that capacity, she embarked on yet another full-time career. She had always been teaching throughout all of her practice and, and, and judging at basically every major law school, Harvard, Yale, and all the law schools in Boston. Um, and, but now she's switching to full-time teaching, teaching criminal justice, courses on juries, forensic evidence, and judicial, judicial decision-making. But now she's more liberated to write and speak about ways to make the law more just for people. In other words, Gertner Unleashed is what we have to look forward to. And the last thing that I want to add on a personal note is that, um, speaking from firsthand experience, um, everyone who ever has the privilege of working with Nancy in any capacity is changed for the better by that experience. In her law practice, um, and then as a judge, and now as a professor, Nancy has mentored countless scores of um, young attorneys. She is a role model that she never had. Um, many of her mentees have gone on to, to great positions of leadership. One, is, one was a law school dean, several are professors. Many are port partners in their own firms and leaders in government. How does that happen? Because when you're in the orbit of Nancy Gertner and you have the opportunity to work with her in collaboration and feel her energy and enthusiasm, you come out feeling energized and, ex and inspired. She makes you feel that you can do things that never occurred to you in the first place, or if they occurred to you, you didn't think you could be successful. She helps you believe that you can try to improve the law, and that if you try, you might actually succeed. I'm looking forward to some of that magic being sprinkled on all of us tonight. I give you Nancy Gertner. That is an unfair introduction. <laughs> it is an extraordinary honor to be here, uh, to, to, to be in Portland, which is actually a city that I love, uh, and especially to honor Judge Coffin. I had appeared before him many times, serious cases to some of the more wacky cases in my practice, I, it must be said. Judge Coffin was unfailingly gracious on and off the bench, and particularly welcoming to a new then young lawyer. I also sat with him on the First Circuit, I looked this up, uh, after I became a judge. He was the very model of a judge. His decisions were written in English, not in code. The reasoning clear and compelling, and more important perhaps, I agreed with him. <laughs> His approach to judging, I think, came from the lives that he had led. His political life, his government non-judge career. He cared that the public understood what he had written and engaged with it. He didn't believe that donning that black robe meant disengaging from the communities in which you live. Now, make no mistake about it. I loved being a judge, but it was not easy. Everyone has to move to neutral to adjust to the bench. I had a particularly difficult time, but not for the reasons that most people expected. Not because I had been an advocate or a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer. In fact, that part was easy. My previous advocacy made it possible for me to know precisely what I believed in, and also where advocacy ended and judging began. There was no illusion as to where my biases were. I knew them. I had a record of almost 24 years of saying them. Uh, so for me, I understood, as I said, where advocacy ended and judging began. There was a physical problem at first. What was the physical problem? So the first day on the job as a judge, I read everything. I read the briefs five times. I memorized them. 
I checked to see if the robe was long enough or you know, if I could actually see my toes from out beneath the robe. Uh, and my courtroom is the old post office square courtroom. It was an old post office that had been jerry-rigged for courtrooms, not particularly elegant courtrooms. Uh, so I prepared, and I couldn't wait to begin. I put on my robe. I entered the courtroom with my head held high. And I immediately sat down on the chair and could not see over the bench. <laughs> could not see over the bench. I was replacing Judge A. David Mazzoni, who was six foot three, and I am five three. I felt like Edith Ann, you know, the, <laughs> the comedian Lily Tomlin's characterization, you know, you feel like Edith Ann, the little girl in the big chair. My first judicial order was phone books, make that three. And I never got the ceremony right. I never got the ceremony right. It was clear. I mean, I, I missed the judging part of the job, but I don't miss the honorary part of the job. I never could get the ceremony right. My clerk would note as I walked out on the bench, I'd, she'd be sitting in front of me, she'd turn around and go, you don't have a robe. I'd walk out without the robe. I kept on walking out without the robe. So they finally put the robe like a passive seatbelt restraint. I walked out and I had to walk into it. <laughs> but even that wasn't good enough. There was a couple of times that I walked out on the bench and my clerk turned around and said, Judge, you don't need your pocketbook on the bench. Women in the, court, women in the audience know, but you take it everywhere. Whoever thought to not? <laughs> but for me, the classic moment of combining life and work um, was literally maybe the first week on the bench. The phone rings in front of me. My clerk, Mary Allen, answers the phone, turns around and says, Judge, Peter's on the phone. Peter was six years old. I said, Mary Ellen, it can't be Peter. He's only six. He doesn't have a dial. She said, Judge, Peter's on the phone. So I get up, you know, assuming the majesty of the office at this point I could see over the bench. I said, gentlemen, it was only gentlemen, I have an important call to take. And I go into my lobby, and I get on the phone, and this tiny voice says, Mom, there's no chocolate pudding in my snack. I resolved that, and I resolved the case, and I went on. <laughs> so that was the, mo the physical stuff was more difficult. But something else troubled me all throughout my tenure. I had been a trial lawyer. Put aside the advocacy for a moment. I had been a trial lawyer. And the seeds of my judging can be found in the pages of my memoir. I cherished living in a country where citizens had a place to go to enforce their rights. I write about a woman who, powerless against sex discrimination in a brokerage firm, uh, whom I helped to become powerful in a court of law. I describe how in the trial of, of a woman accused of murdering her husband, the case told the story of her murder, but with extraordinary effort, I could tell the story of her abuse. I represented workers in the Lynn, Massachusetts GE plant, a woman jockey who wanted to uh, be a jockey when women were not allowed to be jockeys, uh, black school teachers in the Boston school desegregation case. That's what affected my judging. I cared deeply about listening to all claims, no matter how complex or novel or small. I cared deeply about access to the courtroom, about ensuring that my courtroom reflected the weighty promise of our nation's founding. I had been the beneficiary of that access, privileged to enact so many compelling legal narratives of rights and liberties in the four corners of courtrooms across Massachusetts and even across the country. What I saw as a judge troubled me. Not always, but too often, the doors to the courtroom were open to be sure, the rituals of justice were observed, the judge in a robe, counsel, the language of rights, but too often it felt like a kabuki ritual. Too often it felt empty. Judge Shirley Abramson of the Wisconsin Supreme Court described it this way. She described her experience visiting a courtroom after she became a judge. She'd be dressed in a t-shirt, wrap around jean skirt and sandals. She said, the clerk was abrasive, the lawyers condescending, the legal activity taking place in chambers and outside the public view, she encouraged her audience then, who were judges, to visit the courtroom, not as judges, but as people, and try to understand the perspective of an other. 
the experience of what it's like to be in a, a person in the courtroom without the name judge. I had experienced that before I became a judge. I'm experiencing it now. Apart from the physical issues, two legal issues troubled me and troubled me deeply. First, procedural rules. God, this is going to sound incredibly boring, but it will get better. <laughs> procedural rules, technical rules, deployed not to order the trial, not for fairness to the parties, but with the effect of denying access to the court. So procedural rules. And the second thing that troubled me was this extraordinary false consciousness associated with this highly technical law. Judges suggesting that they had no choice but to rule as they had. I have no choice but grant summary judgment, one would say. No choice but to dismiss for failing to meet a filing deadline. No choice but to dismiss the complaint. Procedural rules constrain, law students learn about this, and constrain appropriately. But often, there were no constraints along the lines of what the judges were describing. Justice Rosie Abella of Canada's Supreme Court described it this way. We have moved away from being a society governed by the rule of law to being a society governed by the law of rules. We've been so completely seduced by the notion that process ensures justice that we've come to believe that process is justice. And as to this rule of law of rules, it's an illusion to suggest that judges have no cho choice. Bob Cover, who was a professor at Yale, wrote poignantly about anti-slavery judges in the North. Passionate in their opposition to slavery, they enforced the Fugitive Slave Act with a rigor that was unnecessary, when there was a tradition to which they could have appealed, even a body of precedent. He described the problem as the judicial can't. The judicial can't. C-A-N apostrophe T, not C-A-N-T. The judicial can't. When a judge experiences a barrier against doing even what he or she thinks is right, were these real limits on the judges? Or do they instead indicate just a short-sightedness or even unexamined biases? To cover, can't didn't mean physical incapacity. Physical incapacity would mean there would be no moral dilemma. It literally meant lack, it, for, for physical incapacity, was the lack of the competence to do something. These choices the judges were making were different. There were competing moral choices. Choosing to follow this rule rather than its exceptions, interpreting an ambiguous statute as if it had clarity, rejecting or not pursuing alternative precedents. Judging is about choice. The choice of how much to let a defense counsel present about the defendant's background. When to cut off debate, reject a proffer. Is this going to be just another 20-year-old African-American man dealing a small amount of crack? Or will I allow another story in my courtroom that the defense counsel wanted to present? Choices about how far to research a question before you're satisfied you understand the rule and its implications. Right before I left the bench, I had a case involving a woman prisoner who had had sex with a male guard. She alleged an Eighth Amendment violation. Every case across the country in a like situation had dismissed the charges, had dismissed the charges. A body of law seemed to be evolving that suggested that unless there was force involved, not just, quote, consensual sex in a prison, it couldn't be so bad as to be an Eighth Amendment violation. My clerk presented the papers to me and I said, cannot be true. There cannot be this precedent. Read these cases. She read the cases and each and every one involved a male prisoner and a female guard. Consider that, a male prisoner and a female guard where essentially the court was saying, no big deal. Uh, I refused to dismiss the case. She went to trial and won. As Martha Minow explained, this is an aspiration to impartiality. It's an aspiration, not a description, because it suppresses, as she said, the inevitability of the existence of perspective. Once we understand that there is no objective stance, but only a series of perspectives, we know there is no neutrality, no escape from choice. No escape from choice. Choices about procedures are choices. The choice to shut people out, the choice to create tripwires, 
the choice to elevate case management over everything else. They may be fair, they may be appropriate, but they need to be clear. We have to be explicit about what we are balancing. Now this is way too abstract for this hour of the night. I wish to get into more detail. I'm a storyteller. This was, a, this was sort of the academic part of my presentation. Let me put it aside. So I want to tell two kinds of stories. One about civil rights cases, which I'll talk about in a minute, but one about an ordinary diversity case. There was a man who had a saw and an accident with a saw. He sued the company that was the company that had manufactured the saw before another judge in Massachusetts. And he won his case. He won a substantial amount of money. The case went on appeal and was reversed on appeal. I got the case then as the next judge. In between the Court of Appeals decision and my trial, the man died. His lawyers were supposed to substitute his estate for his name, and they missed the deadline. It was early March. At the end of March, the court records the six-month list. How many cases have you are pending for more than six months? My clerk came to me with this case. He said, Judge, they missed the deadline. You can clearly dismiss this case. They missed the deadline. And then he looked at me as only a 24-year-old could look at me and said, but justice in the world suggests you let it go forward. <laughs> so a judge in that situation has a choice. You miss the deadline, but you could elevate case management over giving him another crack at the court. I allowed the case to go forward. <laughs> so these are, there, there are, not every case is pure discretion. Of course, there are instances where there really is no choice. Uh, but there is choice in so many of the cases that I want to look at. Uh, what's the reasonable statute of limitations? Is it the date on which the first news of the FBI's complicity uh, with William Bulger came out? Or is it the date on which the court, Judge, Judge Wolf, adjudicated the relationship? There is a choice as between reasonable alternatives. One opens the courthouse door, one closes it. Should we excuse government delay in citizenship cases while not excusing the plaintiff's delay in immigration cases? These are choices one makes. But the most extraordinary choices I have been studying and writing about involve civil rights cases. I saw procedural rules elevated above all, the judicial cant, and perhaps this time C-A-N-T, particularly here. Just when we are rightly celebrating the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Civil Rights Act, the signature achievement of the Kennedy-Johnson administrations, the law has been gutted. The law has been gutted. The culprit is not Congress or an executive agency. It is the third branch judges of the United States District Courts. Federal judges from the trial courts to the Supreme Court have interpreted the act virtually, if not entirely, out of existence. Many scholars have described the phenomenon. Plaintiffs in discrimination cases in overwhelming numbers lose, lose on summary judgment, more so than any other category of cases. If they manage to get to trial and succeed, their verdicts are reduced their attorney's fees slashed more so than any other category of case. And if the plaintiff manages to win at trial and, and the defendant appeals, the jury verdict is reversed more so than in any other case. I want to ask three questions about this. What is going on? How did it happen? And why? Again, the national, national data is 60% of cases are resolved on summary judgment. In uh, the civil rights cases, it's over 70. There are some jurisdictions that are 100%. When summary judgment is granted to an employer, affirmance is virtually certain. Employers prevail 86% of the time in published opinions. But the thing that really set me on this path was not the national, national data. A wonderful lawyer in Georgia, I sort of saw myself a little bit in her, wanted to try to figure out why she kept on losing employment cases. So she hired a statistician to look at the data in the Northern District of Georgia, the Northern District of Georgia, and here's what she found in a two-year period. 
She said of 181 cases in which plaintiff had counsel, the court dismissed 95% of them at least in part and 81% in full. Racial hostile work environment cases were dismissed 100% of the time. The most successful plaintiffs were white plaintiffs alleging reverse discrimination. Data broken down per judge revealed that some judges had dismissed all discrimination cases in the two-year period, that when a magistrate judge recommended dismissal, the judges followed 100% of the time. Again, the sample was a two-year period only. To really fully understand this, one needs a longer view. I'm researching other jurisdictions, other northern jurisdictions, other midwestern jurisdictions, other western jurisdictions. And again, if we go to trial and you manage to get a verdict, a higher percentage of jury verdicts amounts are reduced, a higher percentage of attorney's fees application are slashed. If you make it to trial and win, you fare worse on appeal than any other litigants do. You have to pause for a moment. That jury losses are affirmed on appeal should be no surprise. We privilege jury verdicts. But ju that jury verdicts in favor of the plaintiffs are reversed more than anyone else is a statistic that we should give us pause. How does this happen? It happens in cases that I only have a few examples would be stunning to you. Unpublished, unrecognized, unheralded. In Todd versus Fries, a case in the Northern District of Georgia, the Todds, African Americans, sued the Whartons, who were white owners of the club where they worked. The claim was racially hostile environment. The defendants moved for summary judgment on these facts. At manager meetings, Mr. Wharton directed the N-word to the plaintiffs over and over again, despite their objections. In fact, he called a staff meeting to talk about his use of the N-word, explaining he was too old to change and inviting anyone who didn't like it to quit. He made comments like, what do you people want? When this was a white club, my customers used ashtrays. Ever since the N's have been in the club, I can't even say it, cigarettes are put out on the floor. And then they would, he'd say, do days like this make you wish you people had stayed in chains? He asked someone wearing a shirt with a monkey on it, are the Obama shirts in? And complained to the plaintiff that he couldn't trust African Americans. This is in the decision. To the Georgia court, this was not enough. Case dismissed. No reasonable juror the court held could find a racially hostile environment. In language that supporters of the Civil Rights Act would have found appalling, the court added, this is in the decision, quote, while the facts simply show that the Whartons are racist, bigoted, and offensive people, quote, not all profane or racist language or conduct will constitute discrimination in the terms and conditions of employment. None of these incidents, quote, went beyond the ordinary tribulations of the workplace. The ordinary tribulations of the 21st century workplace. The language came from the magistrate's report and recommendation. No objections were filed, and the court adopted the ruling without comment. Racist comments had been part of the ordinary and commonplace workplace when the Civil Rights Act was enacted. That's why the law passed. Now, to be sure, we are living in a time when language is uncivil all over the place. And it may well be that the norms of language and conduct have changed. It may well be that incivility is really more practiced in the ordinary workplace. But step back. Isn't that precisely what a jury should decide? A representative jury was supposed to consider the facts, not a judge whose last employment in the private sector may have been decades ago, who, again, looking objectively at the bench's composition, was likely to be white, male, a former partner in a big firm, or a former prosecutor. In fact, in cases in which allegations like this have made it to a jury, there have been jury verdicts for the plaintiffs. And again, it's not just racist speech that is acceptable, it's also sexist speech. Uh, I have written about, in, in, in other settings, what the concept known as stray remarks. Stray remarks. Courts trivialize, with this concept, courts trivialize sexist and racist comments. They are, quote, not evidence of discrimination at all. 
Is, these are indecisions. Or, quote, they represent the speaker's personal opinion, the speaker's personal opinion, as if that eliminates their poisonous impact on the work environment. The speaker's, poisonous, uh, the speaker's personal opinion. We used to believe that what someone said was a window on their soul. It may be a window on their soul. It may reflect racist animus, or it may not. It would be for a jury to decide. Or arguably, these were not so, quote, severe and pervasive to comprise a hostile work environment. What kinds of remarks are we talking about? Again, some I can't say here. Effing women, I hate these women in the office. Calling someone a whore, a hooker. Again, the court dismissed that case, and I've only given you a piece of it, because the conduct very much like the Wharton case was, quote, general vulgarity that the law doesn't regulate general vulgarity that the law doesn't regulate. There was no hostile work environment in the case of a female sheriff, even though over a four-year period, the supervisor chased her, grabbed at her, groped her, etc., and appeared in the driveway of her home. So it could well be, and I no, don't deny this, that the world has changed and that the rules are different, but again, that's precisely why we have juries and not judges. Uh, Professor Dan Kahan wrote about a case called Scott v. Harris, which was a case uh, in which a man was, uh, in, had a traffic stop, and then he took off, and the police followed him. There was a high-speed chase, and right at the tail end of the chase, the police car bumped into the defendant's car. He, the car flipped over, and he became a paraplegic. The defendant then sued, claiming that the chase and the activity of the police was not reasonable under the circumstances, that in fact he had not endangered uh, public safety by what he, the defendant, did. The court attached a video to the decision, and Kahan had uh, members of a group look at that video to see who saw endangerment and who did not. And he determined, while many saw what the Supreme Court said, that there had been uh, endangerment of the public and it was reasonable for the officer to do what he did, a significant major minority, including, I might, might add, Judge Justice Stevens in dissent, determined that really this was uh, not an unreasonable, not unreasonable endangerment of the public. Kahan linked this to what he called cognitive illiberalism that we see the world through the perspective of a host of other attitudes. And some of the people who didn't see an unreasonable chase were people who were skeptical about police attitudes, skeptical about the police and police behavior, concerned about overreaching by the police, and they viewed the scene through that lens. So people differ through their various perceptual lenses about what is severe and pervasive, about what is a stray remark, about what honest beliefs comprise. So this is now, there is a body of law that essentially is not just people losing these cases, but cases that are legitimizing the losses in the way that I've described. Why? That's what I've spent my new academic career trying to figure out. One explanation I wrote in an article is called Loser's Rules, which is when the defendant moves for summary judgment, and is successful, the case is over. The case is over, there's a dismissal on the basis of summary judgment, uh, and the, case, uh, the, de the plaintiff can appeal. On, on that, in that situation, the judge has to write a decision. He has to state on the record the reasons for granting or denying the motion. But when the plaintiff wins, when the person claiming civil rights violation wins, the judge just writes denied. The case goes on to a jury trial. Nothing prevents the judge from writing when the plaintiff wins, but case management pressures keep us from doing so. Plaintiffs rarely move for summary judgment. They bear the burden of proving all the elements and they want to get to a jury. So defendants move for summary judgment. They, when they win, the judge writes a decision. If the plaintiff wins, the judge doesn't write a decision. As a result, a body of law evolves only in terms of the losing cases. A body of law evolves only in terms of the losing cases. Decision after decision grants summary judgment to the defendant. The effects of loser's rules, and, and what happens is that over time, I'm convinced that 
after judge after judge has described cogently and persuasively why the plaintiff loses, they begin to lose sight of what a winning case would look like. The effects of losers' rules are exacerbated on appeal, while the standard of summary judgment is de novo appellate courts rarely reverse district court decisions granting summary judgment. Employers, as I said, prevail 86% of the time. And I believe that the appeals court are e is even more affected by the skewed pool because they don't see the cases that settle and they see appeal after appeal only of the plaintiff's losses. Uh, so losers rules, a non-ideological explanation for why the law evolves in this extraordinary way. Second is ideology, this belief that we are post-racial, that somehow in the cases that are, as I've cited to you, the notion is the discrimination is over, the market is bias-free, the law's job is just to find the aberrant actor who didn't get the memo, that the discrimination law is about rogue actors, but even the rogue actors are not being identified, that we are post-racial, colleague of mine describes civil rights cases as trivial. And when I was a baby judge 9,000 years ago, the trainer began to teach discrimination law with the phrase, here's how to get rid of these cases. And then there are the cues that are coming from the Supreme Court, et cetera. So losers rules ideology. Perhaps one explanation is these cases are frivolous. And I don't doubt that they are, that some are. There have been substantial changes in the workplace, substantial progress. But the reports of the continuing wage gap between women and men and the continual racial disparity uh, in hiring and in promotion suggest that it cannot be that in some jurisdictions 100% in others 70% of these cases are frivolous. Maybe the good cases are being settled. Good lawyers are settling cases. Maybe that's what's going on. Again, people talk about settlements in the shadow of the law. If the law is as I've described it, I wonder how substantial these settlements are. One explanation may be the quality of practice. Uh, there is no question that as the civil rights bar no longer controlled employment cases, as more and more practitioners believed they could do a slip and fall case on Monday and a discrimination case on Friday, and as the law got more and more complex, some of these losses are attributable to counsel. And then there's caseload pressure, the justice in the world pressure, the pressure to get rid of these cases. And once the body of law has evolved as I've described it, there is a template, a map, to get rid of these cases. So there is a profound disconnect between the aspirations of the law and what we have seen it deliver. It is about access to justice. Having created a system in which we encourage complaints or encourage people to file when they feel discriminated against, in which we seem to take it seriously, but we do not. We decry the vanishing jury trial all the while we have encouraged its elimination. It's a false consciousness that we're promoting, a belief in open access to the courts when they really are not. There are judges in robes, lawyers, the language of rights, but the reality of something else. I miss judging desperately, but I look forward to looking from the outside back in again at what I have seen and to be a critic. I wasn't going to end my talk this way, but after describing uh, Judge Coffin's upbeat nature, I think I, I should. I was in Budapest a few years ago, and I was teaching. And there was a young Jewish student who invited me home with her to meet her parents. And it was a very, very hot day. We were sitting with the parents on their lawn. And I asked her parents, what does it feel like to be in, you know, free, hungry? What does it feel like as a Jew? Uh, what does it feel like under these circumstances? The mother's face paled. She turned to me and said, would you keep your voice down? The neighbors don't know we're Jewish. And then when went inside the house, and she closed the door, and it was stifling hot, and she explained to me that she still has cash under her mattress, 
and multiple passports because she fundamentally did not believe that legal change would really produce social change. We got into a fight the rest of the night because like Judge Coffin, I am an optimist. I fundamentally believe that legal change can produce social change. I believe we've done a considerable amount in the years that I've been a lawyer, and I believe we have much more uh, to go. So I've retired from the bench, but unlike uh, the way some people believe it, I'm still here. Someone sent a postcard, a Christmas card, to the United States District Court in 2011, four months after I'd left the bench. It was a Christmas card, and it had my name on it, and it was returned to sender. And it was returned to sender with a stamp on it. The United States District Court of Messages of my court. The stamp said, deceased. <laughs> I am not. <laughs> I am here. And I will continue to speak out. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. The dean tells me I must accept questions, <laughs> and so I shall. Anyone have any questions? You understand I can't be impeached for anything. <laughs> Anyone? Okay. I was a law student once, so all my kids coming out here to law school about opening the door. Did, did you open the door to a discussion about a uh, mention of Israel? No. Okay, well, let me try this anyways. Uh, when Israel is our most profound strategic partner in the world, and it seems, and the Jewish state term seems to suggest that their fundamental basis of the society is an arbitrary distinction between people, and we are so closely wedded to them, wouldn't that be a major causative agent of sort of a, uh, a shattering of the quality of argument in U.S. legal institutions? It's a very interesting question, but it has nothing to do with what I talked about. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yes. I want to know how the people you cited in some of the cases, with the, with the type of judges, judges, uh, judgment that they've received in their cases, how do they get any hope to um, continue to challenge the system? Uh, I just, it just seems almost impossible in some ways because people are really? poor, they don't, they don't, they can't even, I mean, they can understand what happened, but then what are the next steps? How do you, I mean, just what's your answer to that? Well, that's what I, one of the reasons I wanted to write about this is, you know, my specialty had been sentencing. I wrote a lot about, about criminal sentencing. And judges were very concerned that their sentencing record be public because they feared that the public, you know, there would be some article about you were too lenient, you were too, well, I want to say too harsh, but it was never you were too harsh, you were too lenient. Um, <laughs> and they were concerned that it would be uh, distorted. Um, Records like this should be made public. I don't mean by individual judge, but the record of a court. I suspect, we see some of the uh, Georgia statistics, I suspect other states in the South are going to be the same way. My hope would be to show that this is the way things are going would open up a new conversation about how we're enforcing the civil rights laws. That conversation could take any number of shapes. Maybe it's the courts are no longer the place for these cases. Maybe there should be uh, a, an equal opportunity board that adjudicates these cases with people who have some sensitivity to the, to the context. Maybe there should be, uh, um, the, the, the law should be more detailed. You understand that these cases are interpreting seven words in a statute that says do not discriminate on the basis of gender or on the basis of race. Maybe we should be more detailed. I want to open up a discussion. And then if I, let me tell you a little story about shaming judges. This is not a good story to tell, but I will anyhow, because as I said, I can say anything. 
Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, I was on the bench for about two years, and my clerk said to me, you know, Judge, you have a reputation in town for being anti-patent. I went, good Lord. I have opinions about everything in the galaxy, you know, but patent law? But the, but the inquiry made me go back over the cases I had decided to see if there was a tilt, an unexamined bias that I didn't see. So these statistics by people who do not identify themselves as conservatives, right and left, male and female, doesn't matter who appointed you, the statistics are the same. Maybe they'll go back and examine, re-examine what they have done. So I think that that's an important thing for all of us to do. I'm not interested in highlighting particular judges. I'm interested in highlighting courts in a jurisdiction, in a particular jurisdiction, and maybe they just should step back and say, what am I doing? And why am I doing it? You may conclude that this is appropriate, uh, but it has to be transparent. This is just going to court and losing. And I might add, this is, these were unpublished decisions, which is particularly troubling. Uh, you can, there's a lot you can say in an unpublished decision that you'd be afraid to say publicly. But these, these, the cases I've cited to you are not exceptions, really. I invite uh, law students in the audience to do a, a search for the N-word and discrimination, or bitch and discrimination. And you'd be surprised how many cases have that in them with judges excusing it, as opposed to juries hearing it. Uh, and as I said, you know, this may mean more jury trials. There's nothing worse than a jury trial when you know the plaintiff is gonna lose. I understand that, but that's not my job. Uh, that's not my job at all. When I um, heard that you were coming to speak, uh, I was uh, interested. I'm not a law student. I've been uh, one of the gadflies on the outside pushing the law for 30 years. Um, but I was intrigued because I was at Brandeis at the same time as Susan Sachs and also Angela Davis and have lived through the whole thing. But um, the reality is I, got, I went out and bought your book oh. and I read the whole darn thing. And I would, I would urge everybody in the room to do that because it gave me an insight into uh, what I felt uh, and still feel was a sterling legal mind and professional career, Thank which you. was not always the way I would have run it. <laughs> but of course, I, don't, I, have the, the, um, I have the privilege of not being a lawyer. So I have, uh, <laughs> so I have, uh, I have I, I'm free to have my own opinions even beyond the law. But what I would urge people who are talking about, because um, I've been an advocate all my life for battered women, uh, and I'm appreciative of the work that you did in that area as well, and I uh, was not uh, totally aware of what your role had been in Massachusetts, but I'm glad for it, and I appreciate it. Uh, and I would urge people to uh, read your book as an outline of how an ordinary citizen, uh, even not a lawyer, uh, can make a difference uh, if you just do what you believe is right and are articulate about it. Uh, and so I thank you for that. And uh, Thank you. So did we, did you. I pay you? No. No. Okay. <laughs> no, but I'll take an autograph. <laughs> thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for your great talk. Uh, one of the decisions that civil rights lawyers face um, here, and I'm sure in every state, is whether to file in state court or federal court. And we have some wonderful judges in the audience, both state and federal, and I think the decision isn't really about wh where you're gonna get better judging, but state courts have less resources, um, you know, a more full docket, more pro se clients, and of course the jury verdict issue is different. You don't need a unanimous verdict in state court versus federal court where it's a rocket docket, there are ample resources, but in order to win, you have to have you know unanimous jury verdict. So I'm wondering if you could comment at all in your observations um, in terms of civil rights and where the the best venue is, whether it's the state courts who are doing the the work in this area or it's the federal courts. And if you have a, an opinion, why or what any observations in that? This regard. is the kind of answer that although I won't get impeached, I'll stop being invited to any parties. <laughs> so um, parties are overrated. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, first, let me say something about the case I cited. Georgia has no state discrimination law. So when the federal courts dismiss 100% of the racial harassment cases, there is no other alternative. Um, 
what, it's, that's a very hard question to answer across the country. In Massachusetts, for example, the state court substantive law has parted company with the federal court substantive law of discrimination and is more uh, uh, forgiving for plaintiffs than for defendants. It also happens that because there are, there are fewer resources in state courts, they tend to have more trials. They can't do to the law what these cases are doing because they don't have the resources to stop the cases. Um, other courts uh, have, in fact, what the state courts have mirrored what the federal courts are doing. I, you know, I have opinions about whether this is right. I am more concerned that this is unexamined. Uh, the, this body of law is just unexamined. The courts are not examining it. The judges are not examining it, and it's simply being churned out in decision after uh, decision. So I, the answer is that some state courts, uh, the body of law is different than federal courts, and sometimes just the pressure of a state court docket gets you to, to trial. It may well be that because of those resources, the state court can't intervene in the way the federal courts do at the points that I described, summary judgment, reducing a verdict, reducing appellate uh, attorney's fees, and and the most stunning statistic of all is reducing plaintiff's victories before a jury trial, uh, which is really extraordinary. Again, the statistic was they re it's reversed more than in other cases, uh, which is still extraordinary. Any other questions, or have I depressed everyone? I'm wondering if you believe that there are other judges that are willing to have ah. what may be characterized as an epiphany, although I expect you carried it through your, your judging. Well, I, one of the things that I did is um, I wrote decisions when the plaintiff won. In other words, I wanted to describe what a meritorious claim was to deal with this body of law that it was only about the losing cases. Um, every pressure on the bench is not to write when you don't have to on the, federal, on the district court bench, which is very troubling. So that it means, as I said, the body of law is unequal. There are judges across the country who are beginning to look at this differently, but it has to surface. It's not transparent, it's not obvious. And case after case in tone, stray remarks. Um, my other favorite was honest belief. It was his, there was no basis for belief. There was no objective data supporting your view of Mr. Reinstein's qualifications, but you had an honest belief that he was incompetent. Excuse me? Uh, that may well be true, but it's certainly not for a judge to decide without a jury. Yes? There are some proposed model rules that would significantly restrict discovery in terms of the number of depositions and inter, uh, requests for production of documents and the like that can be taken. Um, in civil rights cases in particular, often, employees are not in possession of the information that they feel they need in order to um, prove their case. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about these proposed restrictions uh, on discovery and how they might impact civil rights cases. I only know about them generally, but the, the, um, one of the things that about discrimination 2013 style is that except for these cases where it's pretty direct, it is mainly proved through circumstantial evidence. Uh, and the circumstantial evidence requires knowing about the patterns of the employer and knowing about other similarly situated employees and requires discovery. Precisely, if we are in a post-racial world, which I don't believe, then discrimination is complex. And the rules, rather than being uh, more strict for civil rights cases, should be less strict because it is more difficult to prove that complexity. Um, something I've written about is that it seems that the Supreme Court is more concerned about false positives than false negatives. By that I mean the courts seem to be more concerned about the wrongful accusation about, of discrimination than the unredressed accusation of discrimination. And the rules in these cases reflect that bent. So I think that that would make a difference that would make a difference in the wrong direction, um, but it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, when you say that judging is about choosing, do, do you mean that in a, as a descriptive thesis, e.g., as a matter of fact, 
there's a lot more discretion in the yeah. judicial realm than lay people mean. So it's not meant as a normative thesis about how judges ought to be deciding cases? Well, it's, it, is, it is descriptive in the, fa in the sense that there is choice, normative to the extent that we have to acknowledge that we're choosing. Um, the, the sort of mantra in self-defense law, which we saw in the Trayvon Martin case, which was a jury issue, was whether or not there was reasonable force used to defend yourself. Reasonableness is obviously a contextual determination. And a judge has to recognize that he's making a contextual uh, determination. You reviewed uh, complaints for plausibility determination. Plausibility, likewise, is contextual. So the extent that it was meant as a normative thesis, do, do you have more specific views then about how judges ought to be choosing? First, I think they have to acknowledge that they are make the choices transparent, and write about them in opinions. That's my normative, pr I can't say which side they ought to choose. But for example, I found judges make credibility, district court judges make credibility determinations. The very first time that I heard a police officer testify, I made, I struggled with my uh, record of having cross-examined officers for years and years and years and wanted to make certain that I wasn't hearing him through the filter of my background. And I determined that I would never, even if I viscerally didn't believe a police officer, even if I didn't believe him viscerally, I would never go with that because I wanted to be aware of my biases. I would only acknowledge disbelieving a police, police officer if there was a reason for it that I could articulate. His, his testimony is inconsistent with the testimony of others, inconsistent with the record, inconsistent with that kind of thing. So I knew I was, credibility is a choice. And you have to, and you, it seemed to me either unexamined or examined that I wanted to make sure it was examined. That's what I said at the beginning. In one sense, I had an easier time than other judges. I knew in the cases that involved issues that I had litigated, I knew where I stood. And judging was a struggle in which you, uh, you understood your uh, biases and you struggled with them. Thanks. Thank you. I know you. Yes. <laughs> we met I, this morning. We did. Um, and in your talk, something that occurred to me and something that I explored um, in a disability law class with Professor Smith was the potential of problem-solving courts and the impact and the potential role of the judge to have a, a more positive net outcome effect and to be rather all about crime and punishment to solve the underlying problems that brought people into criminal justice and into um, really just horrible, horrible situations that affect not just themselves but their families and their whole communities. Uh, and I was wondering what your opinion was as, to, as a judge as to the potential for these courts and also sort of the concerns that have been raised in terms of due process rights and preserving individual due process rights while also trying to make the system better and make the system produce better outcomes and not just be procedurally fair, but right. to actually be fair. I would have loved to have a problem solving court at the front end, in other words, we had drug courts after people had done substantial amounts of time came out and there were re-entry courts and drug courts on the federal side. I would love to have had a diversion program at the front end. I would have loved to have been able to make decisions based on what worked and not based on rules. Sentencing to me felt, I think I mentioned this in class, like the only enterprise was, was I doing the same thing as the judge in the courtroom next to me even if neither of us were making any sense. Problem solving courts do make sense. There's a criticism of them, which is there are a lot of, you know, the, this is not an easy thing to do. Judges are not trained to do it. And so the efficacy of these courts are different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I find that criticism interesting, but when you step back, one thing we know is that the efficacy of prison is less. When someone shows me the ways in which prison has resoundingly succeeded, then I would be more critical of problem solving courts. There is a due process issue. There's no question about it. There are certain cases that, uh, where the stakes are high that are not amenable to that treatment. There's no question about it. 
Um, but it's certainly better than the alternative, which is treating people as categories. And, and that's another talk I can give if you have about another hour. Um, I mean, you know, the, the talk about the extent to which we are incarcerating vast numbers of people. So if problem solving courts are addressing that in a realistic way, even for a small number of people, then of course we should try it. Um, but that's a whole separate talk. Thank you. <laughs>